Sometimes the things you know are the things you don't know until you need to know them, at which point you need to know which ones and which ones the ones you know have to be right. Let's mash on that. Hi, everybody, and welcome to what promises to be a super confusing episode of the ASP Net Monsters. Uh, I, straight jar. We're either talking about async local today or potentially about whether or not we knew if there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I'm not sure. I'll do my best to cover both. Um, some of it might be inferred. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so the problem uh, that we're trying to solve is that in the in the context of a current of a of an operation, we might be passing control off to another thread that's managed for us behind the scenes through the async await pattern. Uh, one of the things that we need to know, though, is you know as we pass off these threads, we dispatch these out to 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 perform some work. Um, often those are done, those require having some kind of information along with the request. The classic example of this, and the pattern is called ambient context. The classic example, the one that we're probably all the most familiar, familiar with, would be the example of the current context for the HTTP request that's being made. You need to know the route parameters, the middleware needs to know the route parameters of the request in order to well, to route the request through to the correct controller and method. And in the same way, if you're inside one of those methods, you need to be able to ask, even though it's not a parameter of the method, you need to be able to ask, what is the my route information so that you might be able to make a, a more informed decision um, in code. So um, we, we were kind of just breaking it down a little bit here before we got started, and there, there was a uh, thread local um, parameter. However, the problem with with async and await is that we're not actually uh, in control of the thread. We're letting the 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 runtime take care of it, the operating system take care of it for us, including coming back from any scheduled um, um, operations and things like that. So what we're going to do is just have uh, have an example here. I've got a class called Breadmaker. Just the first thing that came to mind. I don't know why. Um, Something about baking bread. Um, so bread maker uh, and has a method of bake bread. Now that bread baker might see a number of requests like sourdough, and then there's how long it takes, how many minutes it takes to to bake that bread. And I've got a rye bread here that takes 26 minutes. They both sound delicious. Um, however, uh, when we tell the bread maker to bake the bread, these might just there might be just certain things through the day, like you need to pre-ferment the sourdough, you need to let the autolyze complete on the flour for your rye. So there's going to be reasons why these can't be started right away. And the task scheduling happens, and I don't care how the bread maker uh, puts those in order. Ultimately, I just want to make sure that these things are completed. So I say do first, first batch, second batch, wait for them all, and then we're going to just do a read line on there and wait. Now, um, what we know, all, all we know, all that we can guarantee is that these things will be completed, but we don't know which order they're going to be completed in. Rather, the other th problem that we run into, though, is that inside of this operation, there's some other thing that takes some amount of time. So as I alluded to before, there's some, I just have a random uh, delay in here on the task. But the idea is, is that we're going to be accepting the bread and the baking time of these static variables. So we've got these um, fields here, bread type and bake time. But because I've made them an async local um, of string and int, they're going to stay, those values will remain um, through the execution uh, local to that async operation. So again, I'm calling bake bread with sourdough 22 minutes and Manitoba rye with 26 minutes. And this is entrant and then we, we basically set those tasks up and then we say wait all. Well, inside of here it calls bake and then inside bake there's a small delay um, because that's just an interesting use of it, I guess. Um, however, uh, then we just write line, we baked this bread at for this many minutes. Now, when I run this guy, now when I run it, it's going to be kind of small. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm going to need to up my font size here. Uh, let me do this. Um, but to do properties, 
28. That should be sufficient. So we can see here that it baked the Manitoba rye for 26 minutes and baked the sourdough for 22 minutes. Now, if I keep running these, th those are just because there's a random delay in there. Um, these will just interchange, but it shows you that um, these went through. And even though the the method that actually wrote to the console um, was calling the the local field here to this class, it did so and printed it out with the correct um, value um, based on that um, for for that operation. And and in a nutshell, that is what's going on. So we've got the those two in there, and I can run it again just for just to see if we get a different result. If we run it enough times, it will give us, there we go, sourdough first, rye second. We don't know which order they went in, but they, we know which order we called them in. We don't know what order they're coming out, but they do have the right data when they get to the part of the execution where they require the use of those variables. And that's, that's it. Okay, so what you've got here is you've got these static variables, but instead of just having them a string, you've made them async local. So I behind the scenes there must be some sort of like state machine in effect that looks at what the thread is or i guess what the async context is and then returns you the right value for that particular async context exactly so you'll see that i'm actually not using bread type here i'm using bread type dot value right. and that's that's where that unravels that for us it takes care of the async bits behind the scenes and we don't have to worry about managing that Right. So on the surface, I look at this and I go, that's crazy. Why would you make these things static? Just make them instance. And then you wouldn't have to use async local. But this probably makes a lot more sense if it was in the context of like a, a web request or something where you were retrieving values from like a, from the request object or something like that, right? Right, exactly. A session information that might be making a, a network latent request or something like that out to a, a, a uh, like an in-memory server or something or a, a SQL server or whatever, loading those values up at the start of it and then carrying it through. So rather than requesting it each time, then yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's go take a look at the the source code for ASP.NET Core just to see how they did HTTP context access here. Um, that sounds like a great idea. Well, um, so. Let's so just go to github.com slash .net slash ASP.NET Core. GitHub.com slash ASP net uh, ASP it's core. To, it's moved to .NET now. Oh, .NET, .NET ASP. Net. Okay. Pick you there anyway. And, and where did you want to? to search, I think it is. Okay. And type HTTP context accessor. This class is deceivingly simple. Okay. It, it just has this one thing in it async local of the HTTP context holder, which is just a, a wrapper to the, the actual HTTP context. So it's doing exactly what your bread maker class was doing, but for HTTP context. So within ASP.NET Core, what happens is there's, uh, if you add HTTP context accessor to the service collection, there's a singleton of this HTTP context accessor. Uh, that gets registered and then that allows you to from anywhere if you have an instance of this context accessor you can get to your current HP context that's the one for the current request based on the current async context okay awesome i had a couple of other things in here when i was looking at this originally these are this is why i was able to um, pull this stuff up really quickly but we have um uh, just the, we'll put these in the show notes as well, but just the, the docs. And I actually found this, this is the one that I read, a, a, I don't know if it was a month ago or whatever, when I was looking at this, but it has the, this actually dates back the need for this or the, the work through for this actually dates back seven years. So this, this kind of pattern has been around for, for some time and, um, yeah, so it's, it's not, uh, entirely new, but, um, new to us. Yeah, this doesn't feel like a thing that I would end up using frequently, like considering that I've got to this point and never ever used it. But I guess it's one right. of those ones where when you need it, you really need it. And so yeah. it's a good little tidbit to know exists. Exactly. Exactly. I found out kind of a weird hacky workaround to doing like a service locator type pattern in ASP.NET Core using this. Um, so if you're somewhere inside of your application code that 
for some strange reason doesn't really participate in dependency injection, but you really need to know your current HTTP context. You can actually just create a new instance of HTTP context accessor and then ask for the HTTP context and it magically works because that async local thing is static. Nice. Amazing. There we go. Don't do that, but it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I don't know that this is the approach that I would take if I was writing a similar method, but it was just, uh, yeah, it's a, just an example, a way to demonstrate it really quickly. So, so there we are. And that, that is async local of T in a nutshell. Great. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Remember to like, comment, and share synchronously or asynchronously. We don't really mind. But we'll see everybody on next week's episode. Bye. Cheers. Bye.